Thank you very much for presenting the opportunity to give a speech to the Agribusiness Science Week of the Forum for Agricultural Research in Africa. The title of our talk is The Rapid Rise of Agri-Food Processing Agribusiness in Africa, Opportunities, Challenges, and Policy Implications. When we think about the rise of processed food, very often uh, from the recent debate, it seems as if this is something that has just arisen in the past decade or so. But really, <clears throat> processed food has been emerging and developing as a major part of the African diet <clears throat> for the past 50 years. And uh, you can think of it in the, with the image of a tidal wave. A tidal wave moves a very long distance, maybe a thousand miles over the, di over, uh, over the ocean in a small wave. And then it only surges into a huge wave when it comes near the shore. And this is really what we've been seeing in the development of processed food in Africa. <clears throat> it started in the 1970s through the 1990s, emerging, rising steadily, but then from the 2000s to now, it surged like a huge wave. And Usman Badian, a colleague and friend who thinks a lot about these issues, had the image of a jet airplane a couple of years ago in a talk where he said that the African food system midstream, that is in processing, wholesale, et cetera, is like a jet. It's already taken off and is flying at 20,000 feet, but it could fly yet higher at 35,000 feet. So this is not a question of a new uh, trend starting or trying to get a trend of adding value to food to start. This is something that's been going for 50 years and has surged and accelerated recently over the past couple decades. <clears throat> and as it rises, it's spreading in waves. First, it's spread into first staged processed food, including, for example, milled grains or flour. Then the second wave is it spread into second staged processed foods like breads, biscuits, canned sauces, sodas, etc. And also into prepared foods, which we can call food away from home. Uh, like meals from street vendors. So there's been waves of spread over these uh, levels of processing. Uh, but there's also been a set of waves of diffusion of processed food and of processors uh, over space, starting first in the cities and then into the rural areas. Starting first with the middle class, and then spreading into the, uh, the poor. Starting first with tiny home enterprises and then spreading out and growing into small and medium enterprises, SMEs. And then recently just emerging in many cases is the spread of the processed food supply by large companies. And it started first in grains. And then it's spread into non-grains, animal products, fruit and vegetables, edible oils, et cetera. And it's really interesting because often with economic processes like this, you think of them as gradual, happening over decades, just a little bit. But we, in the many studies that we've been doing of this in the past decade or two, uh, we found that these processes of the spread of agribusiness firms and of the consumption of processed food is not a gradual process, uh, but in many cases, it's a, it's a case of very rapid transformation. And a beautiful example of this is, uh, has been studied by Bart Minton and colleagues at IFPRI in Ethiopia on the uh, subject of processed TEF. Uh, and TEF is a kind of a cereal and it, uh, over just 10 years in the study that they did, they found that there was massive investment by small and medium enterprise truckers in the transport of TEF. Uh, 
So there was a very rapid rise of these trucks and an increase of the size of these truck, trucks. And you saw something like a shift from uh, walking or moving TEF by horse to moving TEF by motor vehicles in TEF value chains in just 10 years, very similar to a shift in transport in value chains that we saw in US in 100 years. We also saw in these studies of IFPRI in Ethiopia, a huge jump in just 10 years of urban wholesale and milling of TEF and sales of Injera, which is a kind of prepared version of TEF in food and away from home and food service enterprises. And this was rising not through uh, agroparks or the government establishment of these firms, but through the very rapid uh, rise of spontaneous clusters of small and medium enterprises. This we found to be by far the main way that uh, SME agribusiness are spreading in Africa is through these spontaneous clusters, grassroots investments. And fascinatingly, there was a 50% drop in transport costs caused by the wholesale and the trucker investments, and even a drop in mills and wholesale margins over the 10 years was the, the, the development was so quick. And none of this boom, similar to other booms we've seen in Africa, involved subsidies by the government. No NGOs were involved. No big companies were setting up contract farming or leading the way. There was no government direct involvement, just government creating enabling environment investments in highways and wholesale markets. And once that situation of this, that good environment was there, there was this very rapid investment by the small and medium enterprises themselves. And we've seen many grassroots booms like this in Africa. And here's an example, there was a 300% rise in these enterprises of wholesale trucking and milling of, um, of TEF in just 10 years. This is an agribusiness miracle at the small level and really the main way that agribusiness is growing in Africa. Secondly, we can think about the long-term drivers of processed food spread in Africa. Uh, there are three. The first one is definitely the demand driver. And this is really driven by women's opportunity cost of time as they work away from home uh, and their desire also to escape fatigue and drudgery. That's what processed food does. It's a substitute for fatigue and drudgery. The study showed in 1990s in the Gambia, for example, <clears throat> that village women and girls were spending four hours a day pounding grain. So when processed the grain became available, they jumped at it. And partly this is because women in Africa have been increasingly working outside the home over these several decades. And uh, this has been first in urban areas, but also in rural non-farm uh, development, in, in rural non-farm employment. And a lot of that rural non-farm employment of women in, in rural areas has been in processed and prepared food enterprises. And men and women have also been increasingly commuting across towns to work. And by doing so, that's driven up the demand for food away from home, from food service enterprises, another form of agribusiness. This is really linked with rapid urbanization in Africa. You look at the numbers, similar, really the similar to Asia. 18% in 1970, jumped up to 42% in 2021. And as we've shown elsewhere, if you look at the share of cities in total food consumption in Africa, it's about 60 to 65%. So it's bigger than the share even of the urban population in total population. And also there's been a densification of rural areas. 90% of rural Africans live near towns. Only 10% live in hinterland areas. So with this densification, there's been also changes in diets. A second driver has been technology. The debate about technology is often focused on farm technology, <clears throat> but I would argue that processing agribusiness technology is, in, is as important to transformation of the food system <clears throat> in Africa 
as is uh, farm technology. And African technology in agri-food is changing very fast. And this is mainly because of transfer or adaptation of, for example, processing technologies from early transformers in the US and Europe. A lot of things like extrusion, et cetera, that came in. Um, and there's been an evolution of technologies for first stage processed foods, for example, into grain into flour from home hand pounding, even in the 1970s, 1980s, even 1990s, it was dominate, dominant to small hammer mills and then to medium large roller mills. So that hand pounding is now by far the minority of processing of grain in Africa. And going from bulk or unpackaged uh, grain, you know, flour to packaged and branded uh, flour. In the evolution of the technologies for second stage processed foods have also proceeded apace uh, for ways of converting flour into bread, into noodles, into biscuits, for example, moving from hand processing to extrusion machines and blenders. <laughs> from wood stoves to gas ovens and oil, and oil pressure cookers, from unpackaged foods, for example, fritters at street vendors, to a rapid spread of packaged process, uh, second stage processed foods in Africa, for example, biscuits in stores. And with this, there's been a boom in small and medium enterprises in food processing, both first stage and second stage, and with that packaging, labeling, and branding. We had been doing studies in Asia, and what we've seen in Africa in the past 10 years is very similar to what happened in Asia just 10 years before that. So it's essentially a convergence process, and you can see the kinds of products that are emerging. And also driving uh, processed food and processed food agribusiness have been commercial drivers. <clears throat> You've seen the these enterprises go from mainly tiny home enterprises to a massive spread of small and medium enterprises, which are now the dominant players by far in processed food agribusiness in Africa and also in food service. And this has included a big employment of women in processing small and medium enterprises. Um, and lately, and much less important, but emerging is the emergence of large processors. Okay. And you've gone from uh, huge, you, you've seen huge national and domestic investments uh, in the aggregate, okay? And these are still the dominant players in Africa. It hasn't become a transnational enterprise. And yet there's also transnational enterprises that are rising in Africa, and many of them are regional multinationals. For example, Bakresa, based in Tanzania and spreading all around Eastern and Southern Africa. And recently, and somewhat, there's emerging global foreign direct investment, for example, Nestle and dairy uh, that could grow over time. Um, and we've seen a shift in the commercial forms from custom milling, for example, to bulk sale in markets, to small street vendors, food away from home, to package sale of processed foods in small shops. And small shops are still by far the dominant channel of processed food in Africa, both uh, first stage processed food and highly processed food. Just emerging are actors like supermarkets uh, that are still a minor channel for processed foods, but are emerging as a player. And very interestingly, because often people think a lot of the processed food is being imported, the imports of first or second stage processed foods are very small share of total processed food in Africa. So the processed food revolution in Africa, both in its demand side uh, in its supply side is operated mainly by small and medium enterprise processing firms. And it's being retailed mainly via small shops. So this is so far a grassroots revolution. The current situation is resulting, that's resulting from these drivers and trends is very interesting. And I'll give you an example from Tanzania. The common image that one has is that these processed food uh, agribusinesses are uh, mainly selling to the urban middle class, that the demand side is an urban middle class phenomenon. But our research has showed <clears throat> that it spread well beyond the urban middle class into the diets of the urban poor, only a little bit behind uh, the non-poor customers, and into rural areas, 
only a little bit behind urban consumers, and even into the diets of the rural poor. An example from Tanzania shows in rural Tanzania that 63% of the diet that's purchased uh, goes 29% to unprocessed foods, 56% to low processed foods like flour, and 1% is to high processed unpackaged foods like sweet buns, mandazi, and 6% is to ultra processed foods like soda pops and cookies, et cetera. So this is just emerging and 5% of it goes to meals away from home. So you have this huge demand for time-saving processed food, especially flour. And in urban Tanzania, uh, 22, because almost all of the consumption is purchased, 22% of total consumption is unprocessed, 49% is low process. Okay, so it's lower share than in rural areas uh, because there's more importance, but not too much more of, uh, of higher, highly processed foods. 2% is from high process unpackaged sweet buns and 9% uh, still far below low processed foods are ultra processed foods like soda pop and cookies. And a whopping 18% is meals away from home. So agribusness that's being is essentially food service agribusiness, food industry is super important in um, urban areas in Africa. And here's an example from, uh, from Tanzania. So, the punchlines here from the Tanzania case that are, we've seen in other parts of Africa is that the processed food patterns in demand and supply are converging over urban and rural areas. And first stage processed foods are leading, but the second stage in ultra processed foods and food away from home are growing. I'll wrap up with the implications of these trends. We believe food processing is here to stay and still in the rapid rise phase in Africa. A recent debate about processed food emphasizes nutrition and food safety issues. We think these are uh, valid concerns about that there are valid concerns about the emerging intake of ultra processed food leading to obesity and diabetes in Africa as it has globally. But we believe at the same time, the overall debate about processed food, both from the demand side and from the agribusiness side, should be nuanced because agri-food processing provides important benefits to Africa. <clears throat> the first one is food processing is a very important employer of African women. Secondly, processed food saves African women time, freeing them for employment, uh, home tasks, and rest and leisure. Remember the old days of four hours of pounding with heavy sticks per day is being displaced by processed food. Food service and food away from home is important to the commuting poor and the poor without kitchens. Food processing is a major market opportunity for African farmers, including for quality differentiation. SMEs processors even help farmers with information and inputs, as a review by Sawida Liverpool Tassi has shown recently. In many cases, food processing reduces the cost and seasonality of food for the poor. SME processing sector has grown rapidly in the past 20 years where the enabling environment is present. Okay, I, we feel very strongly about this. Uh, a lot of times you hear there's a missing middle in Africa, uh, but we call it a hidden middle because the, the sectors in the middle, the processing and wholesale and logistics are not missing. They're just hidden from the debate. And people imagine that we have to to invent them, to create them, when in fact they're roaring ahead, and uh, especially when the, the enabling environment is present. And this growth has been based on spontaneous growth, not agroparks or managed clusters. These, I think, will, are going to be, have been, and will be a very minor part of agribusiness in Africa. The main growth, especially for the next 10, 15 years, is going to be these spontaneous clusters of small and medium enterprises. We, may, we believe that the main role of government and donors should be to create an enabling environment for these. Focus on the fundamentals, what I call the blood and bones of the food system, which are roads, electricity, wholesale markets. These, when we've seen, whenever those are present, the SME processing sector has roared ahead. And we, you can also have good policies that will help SMEs get credit, 
uh, produce and move goods without undue red tape and taxation. These are also concomitant policies that will help build on the basic infrastructural foundation that's needed for this sector and this agribusiness to soar even further than it's already started soaring in Africa in the decade ahead. Thank you very much.